Thank you, thank you. <laughs> We're very time compressed today. The bottom line is ICD-10 is coming October the 1st, and it's not going to be delayed any longer. And, but we want to get to some uh, high clinical points to talk about uh, why this is important to us. Big increase in the number of codes, but most of them apply to the musculoskeletal system. A full third of them is just because they've added left and right. Now, it's important to, to physicians, not just that we're going from ICD-9 to ICD-10, but it's what they're doing with the codes after they leave the hospital. We're going to be graded for quality of care and cost efficiency of care, and the insurers have already had access to those codes, uh, and the public's going to have access to them too, and they're going to begin to adjust our reimbursements based on those assessments of quality and cost efficiency. Not just Medicare, but the private payers as well. The fee-for-service system is going away. In January, uh, ortho is going to bundle payments for knee and, and hip joint uh, reimbursements. And they want to link everything eventually to quality and cost efficiency. And they're doing that through the physician value-based purchasing modifier. But they're all based on the ICD-9 and ICD-10 codes. Information into the system comes through the physician quality reporting system and from hospital claims data for admitted patients. They're not looking at our charts. They're looking at all the number of ICD-9 codes that get attached to the billing record that describe the patient's complexity and severity of illness and looking at the length of hospital stay and how much we spent to accomplish their care. And this is the information they're using to determine our quality of care and cost efficiency of care. This is a screenshot from Medicare.gov. This is available to the general public any place in the world. You've got a computer and a Wi-Fi connection. They will have very soon quality data uh, on this public website. There's also a confidential report that every physician has, uh, and there's an appendix at the end of the handout that describes how you can get your own information. Each physician is going to be rated as high, average, or low for both cost and quality, and it all comes from that data. For the mega groups with more than 100 members, those adjustments started happening the first of this year. For those of us in smaller groups, everybody's going to be involved by the year 2017, and they look at records beginning two years prior, so they're looking at everybody's records now. And if uh, come 2017, when this is implemented for all of us, if you are deemed to be high quality and low cost, then they'll boost your reimbursement 4%. If you're deemed to be low quality and high cost, then they will take 4% away. These are the diagnoses they're looking at to, to judge those assessments. COPD, coronary artery disease, heart failure, and diabetes. They're dividing physicians up into to what percentage of the patient's total billing came from that physician. Okay. And if you're more than 35% of the total, you're in one category. If you're less than 20% of the total, which we as emergency physicians would probably be, uh, you're in another category, and then between the two is the third category. And exactly what they're gonna do with that differentiation, I'm not sure, but it does go to the fact that it's not a me anymore, it's a we. It's important now more than it's ever been to accumulate all the secondary diagnoses because they add to the patient's total uh, reflective complexity of care, which in reality we're taking care of, and so whomever is the most OCD physician that's taking care of that patient for the calendar year that accumulates the most secondary diagnoses, it helps everybody that's been attached to that patient over the course of the year. But surgeons, anesthesiologists, hate to be called to somebody's deathbed to put in a central line because you know this patient's not going to survive, but now your name is attached on this patient that's going to have a mortality associated. That's life. I don't know how to get around that. Now, Come 2017, there's going to be this merit-based incentive payment system. So everything is going to change to MIPS in 2017. And each of us is going to be scored between 0 and 100 in each of these four categories. Quality of care, meaningful use of electronic records, and use of health care resources. In other words, how much we spend to accomplish what we do, and activities undertaken to improve clinical practice. And the incentive goes from minus four to plus four to an increase bonus of not more than 10%, says the law, to a deficit of 9%. Risk adjustment, that's you know, why life insurance policy for a young healthy person costs less than an old person that smokes three packs a day. But we're interested in risk adjusted outcomes, which is observed versus compared. And we can measure pretty much anything and then compare that 
to how much is spent in the course of that care and gives a concept of cost efficiency. So observed outcomes come from the record, uh, but where do these expected outcomes come from? How do they know who to compare my care to? Well, these are other patients with similar demographics uh, and similar ICD-9 codes for the principal secondary diagnoses and procedure codes. So if the height of this bar represents my patient's true total complexity of illness, severity of illness, but the height of this bar represents what the coders can code and thus report to the world how sick my patient is. Between here and here, we've got a, a problem, and it's this documentation gap that's the difference between my patient's true severity of illness and how it is represented, and it's determined completely by the documented language that I use in the chart and the coder's ability to translate that into terms that we get credit for in ICD-9 and ICD-10. And we don't get credit sometimes for all the words that we use. Important concepts, principal diagnosis, that condition established after study may not be immediately apparent, uh, but that condition chiefly responsible for occasioning the inpatient admission to the hospital. Secondary diagnoses, anything that requires clinical evaluation, therapeutic treatment, diagnostic procedures, anything that extends the length of the hospital stay or increases nursing care or monitoring, and then procedures. Now it's these three elements that make up the DRG that determines how much the hospital gets reimbursed, but it's also these elements now that we need to be interested in because it's these things that make up the sum total of what we're being graded for for quality of care and cost efficiency of care. So we're all in the same boat together now. It's a, it's a we, not a me. Observed outcomes versus expected outcomes. So this group of patients to whom my care is compared depends not on how sick my patient is, but how sick my patient looks on paper to the coder. And that's based on what I write in my emergency medicine note, what's in the H&P, the progress note, and, and most importantly, the discharge summary. So when we close this gap, we're gonna reduce downcoding and just abject denials of payment because we didn't demonstrate the medical necessity for the services that we provide. And medical necessity is what the, the payers think is necessary, not what we as doctors think. Our quality portrayals will be accurate, our cost efficiency portrayals will be accurate. Now there's no Rosetta Stone for translating out the language that we use with each other and on the medical record into these processing languages. There are three languages primarily used, MSDRG for inpatients used by Medicare and most of the private payers. Uh, APR DRGs are used by Medi-Cal and a third methodology, HCC's hierarchical condition categories. This is the methodology that they use to grade us. But these are all processing languages used for billing, reimbursement, and analysis. But they're all designed to communicate the patient's severity of illness. Within each of these, uh, there are different mechanisms for describing the patient's severity of illness. In the MSDRG system, it revolves around a term called a CC. One C stands for comorbidity, everything the patient brings with them before the inpatient order is signed, uh, the chronic conditions and the new conditions like heart attack, stroke, uh, fractures and the like. And uh, the other C is complications, things that arise anew after the inpatient order is written. And an MCC is just a major one of those. So it's a three-tiered system, MCC, highest level of severity, CC, middle level, and then neither one um, uh, for which we get uh, no increased relative weight. In the APR-DRG system, there's two categories, severity of illness, risk of mortality. Each has a number between one and four, one not very sick, four very sick and the numbers don't have to be the same. In the HCC system, every condition, every ICD-9 code has a fraction of a number relative weight assigned to it and you add all those fractions up together and you get a total number uh, that reflects the patient's severity of illness. These are called outpatient DRGs because as these two are applied only to inpatient admissions, the HCCs accumulate ICD-9 codes now regardless of the location where the diagnosis was made, inpatient or outpatient. There are ICD-10 codes for non-compliance, for example, which is very helpful. Now we can defend ourselves, you know, medical legally by documenting in the record non-compliance, but in ICD-9 there are no codes for that. In ICD-10, we can tell the world on the front end uh, that the patient is non-compliant and they'll be able to do statistical analysis on outcomes. So it, it is helpful in that regard. Now, this is in the MSDRG system, the three tiered categories of severity. And notice there's no increased weight for these terms, altered mental status and unresponsive. And these are two of my favorite terms in more than a quarter century practice of emergency medicine. 
because these are symptoms. They don't give you a clue what's going on, they're just symptoms. But if we can name the altered mental status as a delirium or a psychosis, if, there's, if their mental status is altered because their sodium is 110 and that's why they have a delirium, well that's actually secondary to the metabolic encephalopathy of hyponatremia and we get huge increased relative weight for that. Same patient, same doctor, same nurses, same therapy, we get no increased relative weight for this, we get huge increased relative weight uh, for that. And it's important for us to understand some of these examples of the nomenclature where the coding system grants credit in places where it doesn't. Because physicians have not been uh, involved in um, establishing relative weight. In the area of heart failure, you know, when, when we all went to medical school, if somebody was hospitalized with an exacerbation of heart failure, we just wrote down for the diagnosis CHF. Well, that's not uh, adequate now to get full credit for it, we have to note that it's an acute exacerbation of heart failure because they had heart failure last week, they weren't in the hospital, so what changed? They have an acute exacerbation of heart failure and they want to know if it's systolic, diastolic, or combined. If we note the functionality, then it's an increased relative weight at the mid-level. So even if they have heart failure but it's not an exacerbation, we get increased credit for that. If they have an acute exacerbation of systolic or diastolic heart failure, we get uh, dramatic increased relative weight for that. So no increased relative weight for symptoms, but for acuity, we do. And that's one of the new things in ICD-10. The HCCs are particularly important to us because they're the methodology used to adjust our reimbursements. They're the system that Medicare uses to identify the cost per beneficiary, and this is the system that Medicare uses to fund accountable care organizations and independent practice organizations, so very important for us. This is an example of a table about a single patient, 65-year-old female. You'll notice that based on calendar year codes, because the HCC codes expire at the end of every year, and the motivation for this is to, to be sure that we see uh, the patient during the course of the calendar year. If we don't, all we get is what's based on her demographic. Uh, so when we multiply this relative weight by the reimbursement uh, uh, base rate, which is about $10,000, we've got $3,000 to care for her. But she's got a lot going on in her life. She has breast cancer, which has a dramatic increased relative weight, three times her baseline. Because she has metastases to bone, it doubles the relative weight yet again. She's been sick, so she's malnourished. Big increased relative weight for that. More for, for uh, pressure sores. And so when we total those all up together, her total risk adjusted factor is almost six. And so we have almost $60,000 in the pool to care for her next year. So it's, it's very important to, uh, to capture those. You notice where it says history of breast cancer, there's no relative weight assigned to that. And that identifies the ambiguity of that phrase that we were taught and that we use. But what the coding system says, if somebody has a history of something, they don't have it anymore. They had it, they don't have it anymore, and we're not treating it at all, so, uh, so we don't get any increased relative weight for that. In ICD-9, the codes were five digits long. In ICD-10, they're seven digits long, and they can, in many of these columns, be alpha or numeric, so it greatly increases the room for expansion. New concepts in ICD-10, we talked about acuity, acute, chronic, or acute on chronic. You know, they had this condition, heart failure, asthma. Uh, last week, they weren't in the hospital, what changed? Increased note of anatomic specificity, particularly applicable to surgeons. If you're lysing adhesion, every organ that you're, that you're freeing from adhesions needs to be noted. Uh, and even, for example, the stomach, the lesser curvature has a code, the greater curvature has a code. Uh, if, you're, if you're a cardiac surgeon and you're lysing adhesions, there are codes for the left and right atria, left and right ventricle. And it makes a, the, the relative weight assigned to those makes a, a big difference. And, and all that accrues to your total risk adjusted factor, which, which goes to your quality of care. Left and right, uh, we got that down. Episodes of care apply to the uh, trauma and medication toxicity related events. The initial episode is during the active treatment phase. Subsequent codes are attached to diagnoses during the healing phase. And sequelae codes are used when the healing is totally complete, but there's something arises that relates to the uh, original injury or toxicity. Combination codes, the fast food industry is way ahead of us on that. Present on admission identification. 
Every ICD-9 code, every ICD-10 code that's produced, the coders have to note whether it's present on admission or not. Most of the time it's obvious, sometimes it may not be. So if we identify sepsis or pulmonary emboli or cutaneous ulcerations, if they were present on admission and they're not noted in the H&P or the first problem list, uh, if they were in fact present on admission, we need to so state so we don't get dinged for things uh, uh, that, uh, that they don't think should happen during the course of hospitalization uh, if they get documented. Acuity, acute cholecystitis, acute on chronic cholecystitis, we get increased relative weight for. Chronic cholecystitis, no additional relative weight, and if we just don't say, we don't get any relative weight for that. So if somebody has an acute exacerbation, we need to say so. This notes that just by throwing the word acute in front of everything doesn't always get us increased relative weight because acute bronchitis is just not that resource intense. An example of increased anatomic requirement in ICD-9, if you have a, a malignant neoplasm of the lung, that's what got coded. But in ICD-10, we've got left and right, we've got lower lobe, overlapping lobes. But if we don't add that anatomic specificity, we don't get any increased relative weight for it at all. More on the episodes of care, uh, this is to remind me to tell you that the CPT code for an initial encounter with a patient that's new to you or new to your practice is totally different from what we're talking about here. CPT does not change at all, uh, so we'll still use that. This has to do uh, with the patient's phase of healing, not with our encounter with the patient. Bundle payments. They have identified that fee-for-service just rewards quantity of care and they're trying to tie things to quality of care. So January 1st of next year, they have announced that for orthopedics, for joint and hip replacement, they are going to be reimbursed uh, in bundled payments. And how that works is now, everybody that has a stake in, in the patient's care sends a bill and gets a check. In the bundled environment, there's one check that'll come to the hospital or the accountable care organization and everybody that's involved in that patient's care will get a slice of that pie. And uh, historically, orthopedists have you know, sent a bill for the procedure and that covers the procedure and the immediate post-operative period. What happens now is everybody's payment is gonna come out of that bundle. So the hospital's payment, the anesthesiologist's payment, the orthopedist's payment is gonna come out of that bundle. And for the orthopedists, it's not gonna be the first 30 days, it'll be the first 90 days after discharge. So any outpatient follow-up treatments will be paid for out of that bundle. Home health service will be paid for out of that. And if they have to get readmitted within the, that 90 day period, there's no more money coming, it comes out of that first bundle. So there are several programs that have been involved in pilot studies of this, or orthopedics prominently among them, and it's helped break down silos of communication between primary care, surgeons, anesthesia, lab, discharge planning, and, and several hospitals are thriving uh, with these. This changes our whole environment. I mean, now, uh, you know, there's a bundle that's going to be a certain size, and the more secondary diagnoses that we describe, that, that describe the patient as complex as they truly are, the bundle grows with that. So, so if, if we just say patient has hip, you know, remote hip fracture, needs, um, you know, total knee replacement, and we don't mention the hypertension, the diabetes, the, the, the lupus, the chronic kidney disease, then the bundle is going to be small. But if we accumulate all those things and document all those things, the bundle grows with that. And, and so now we have an interest in not ordering too many tests because that takes money out of the bundle. And, and uh, we, we may be willing to pay a little bit more for home health service just to make sure the patient takes their medication, is up in ambulatory, to try to prevent those readmissions. And they've demonstrated that, that uh, the bundle payment program reduced expenditures for, for these uh, joint replacements uh, an average of just shy of $400 a case, which doesn't sound like a whole lot, but in 2014, they did 430,000 joint replacements. I mean, so that, that adds up, that adds up. So this is, they're, they're, they're trying to change our incentive. So here's how CDI can impact bundle payment. Here's a patient that undergoes a joint replacement. And so we note that the patient was HIV positive but the CDI recognized that remotely the patient had had an AIDS-defining illness or an AIDS-defining CD4 count. And of course, they're gonna be on their antiretrovirals forever. So because we're treating the condition of AIDS with the antiretroviral, 
by calling it you know, AIDS-related disease or AIDS, we add that secondary diagnosis at the highest level of severity and the bundle jumps $20,000 just with that little detail. So these can change in a hurry. Revision of a hip or knee replacement, no secondary diagnosis. Here's the relative weight of the procedure itself and the bundle for the procedure itself. But when we identify a secondary diagnosis, even at that mid-level, the relative weight goes up which accrues to every physician involved in the patient's care, the anesthesiologist, the orthopedist, the hospitalist, if they're involved in there, and the bundle goes up accordingly. If we identify a secondary diagnosis at the highest level, the relative weight almost doubles, as does the bundle payment. So here's some secondary diagnoses that are often missed. Any form of malnutrition is a secondary diagnosis at the level of a CC. Severe malnutrition is a MCC. You know, as joint replacements are elective surgeries, it's hard to identify a major uh, comorbidity or complication uh, for those because uh, usually they're exacerbations of, of acute exacerbations of disease. Uh, but, but I could see it could happen in somebody that's malnourished. Acute blood loss anemia. You know, a liter of blood is expected to be lost in a hip replacement. So, so that's enough to categorize acute blood loss anemia. Acute blood loss anemia does not automatically code as a complication. So we can capture that diagnosis and it's a secondary diagnosis at the level of a CC. Systolic heart failure, not an exacerbation. If someone is a smoker, if they have withdrawal symptoms and if they're you know, prescribe Chantix or have nicotine gum or nicotine patches, they're treating symptoms of withdrawal with that. And when we document nicotine dependence with withdrawal, that's a secondary diagnosis at the level of CC. Chronic respiratory failure, if somebody's on home oxygen, there has, for Medicare to pay for that, there has to be some blood gas analysis out there somewhere that demonstrates they're hypoxic on room air or Medicare won't pay for it. So by documenting chronic respiratory failure based on remote blood gas analysis, instant secondary diagnosis at the level of a CC. Now, hospitals that, and medical staff that don't get this education, that don't document these things, are the ones that are gonna get in fiscal trouble because they're gonna take care of patients that are this sick, they're gonna code out this sick, so they're gonna be reimbursed at this rate, and they're gonna be spending more money than they get back. And uh, Ezekiel Emanuel, does that name ring a bell? He's the, the brother of Rahm Emanuel, Chicago's mayor. He's a physician, very active in the, the production of the Affordable Care Act. He says, we expect 20% of hospitals to close. And this is, this is how that's going to happen. They'll be taking care of sick people. They won't describe them as sick, and they won't get reimbursed appropriately. So here's a small bowel surgery in the bundle payment environment. No secondary diagnosis, a secondary diagnosis at the mid-level. You can see the relative weight goes up and the bundle goes up, of course. But also, as we accumulate secondary diagnoses, the expected length of stay goes up as well. So, you know, if you've ever felt pressure, you know, to get the patient out because we're getting toward the end of their expected length of stay, when we identify secondary conditions, we get more increased length of stay. And, and this, you know, this is one of the categories that's on the billing form, the, 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 the length of stay. So if we, if we have sick patients that we get out early, makes us look good. And that's, uh, that's going to accrue to our quality and cost efficiency of, of care. Now, we're being asked to describe a few more of the trees to justify calling it a forest. This is a mnemonic that my partner created to help pull some of these things in. It's called Music Manifestation. The presenting signs, symptoms, syndromes, U, underlying causes, S, severity or specificity, I, instigating or precipitating causes, and C, complications or, or consequences. When we link condition and cause or condition and consequence, almost always the relative weight goes up. And here's a simple example of that. Manifestation, back pain, near syncope, underlying cause, aortic dissection, severity or specificity, tearing, ripping sensation, ascending toward the shoulder blades, instigating or precipitating cause, uncontrolled hypertension, resulting in spontaneous rupture, acute blood loss anemia. We can try to uh, pull these things together. Somebody with appendicitis, we'll talk more about appendicitis in a little bit because there's some interesting aspects in ICD-10. So here's appendicitis with no peritonitis, no secondary diagnosis, secondary diagnosis to the level of a CC and MCC. So if somebody has heart failure, not history of heart failure, but somebody has heart failure, not in exacerbation, uh, that's a secondary diagnosis at the level of a CC. Again, chronic respiratory failure, but if they have decompensated heart failure, then that's a, an MCC. So this is what I was getting to with appendicitis. 
It seems like just having appendicitis ought to be enough to get credit for separating somebody from their appendix. But if we just call it appendicitis, we get no increased relative weight at all. If we call it acute appendicitis, then that is a secondary diagnosis at the mid-level of a CC. But if we call it acute appendicitis with localized peritonitis, and how else do you know they have appendicitis, then that's an MCC, and we get huge increased relative weight for that. Similarly, with generalized peritonitis, similar le level of relative weight. Now, in the Medi-Cal system, for generalized peritonitis, there's a little bit increased relative weight for that. Generalized peritonitis, to me, is a totally different animal than localized peritonitis. Because if somebody has generalized peritonitis, I'm thinking something broke. You know? And I'm automatically thinking, do they, do they meet the criteria for sepsis? under that circumstance. For some reason, the coding system now identifies the appendectomy, of course, is the procedure that drives the DRG. But now when we have either localized or generalized peritonitis, it counts as a complicated principal diagnosis because of the localized peritonitis. And it changes the DRG to appendectomy with complicated principal diagnosis with an MCC, the localized peritonitis being the MCC. So we go from an appendectomy with no secondary diagnosis, relative weight of 0.9, to more than three times that. The bundle goes from less than 10,000 to more than 30,000. The doctors that get this first are gonna look better on paper. They're gonna be the ones that get that 4% boost, or, or soon, you know, that 10 up to 10% boost. Uh, this is not a quality of care issue taking care of the patients. This is a getting credit for it issue. The whole process of clinical documentation integrity is, is, is about accurately describing the patients using the language that we get credit for. It's not about ascribing the patient a condition that they don't have. It's being accurate and honest and, and doing it with integrity. So if I see somebody with generalized appendicitis, I'm wondering, do they meet the criteria for sepsis, which is infection that's either documented or suspected in some of the following, which means at least two, fever, uh, hypothermia, temperature too high or too low, tachycardia, tachypnea, altered mental status, which we now understand uh, should be described as the encephalopathy of sepsis for that increased relative weight, fluid shifts, hyperglycemia in the absence of diabetes greater than 140, white count too high, greater than 12, too low, less than 4, band forms greater than 10 percent, elevated CRP or procalcitonin. Notice you don't have to have a positive blood culture to diagnose sepsis. Not a requirement to diagnose sepsis. But we do need to use findings that aren't easily explained by other causes. So, if, you know, if somebody has a fever of 102 and a, white can or a, a heart rate of 95 and I give them a couple of Tylenol and a liter of fluid and now their heart rate 70, well maybe they were just dry uh, and, and weren't really septic. Has to pass the smell test. These people need to be uh, sick, of course. Severe sepsis, sepsis with acute organ dysfunction, hypoxia, decreased urine output, increased creatinine, coag abnormalities, ileus thrombocytopenia, hyperbilirubinemia, or perfusion variables like decreased capillary refill or modeling. And beyond severe sepsis is sepsis shock, defined as either refractory hypotension uh, unresponsive to a fluid challenge, or the secondary biochemical marker of hypoperfusion, which is a blood lactate level of greater than four millimoles per liter. If it's greater than four, even if their pressure hadn't dropped yet, that supports the diagnosis defensively of compensated septic shock or any other kind of shock. The term urosepsis has no code. It's a fine word. We just can't use it. Uh, we have to say sepsis due to pyelonephritis or sepsis due to a urinary tract source. Urosepsis has to go. In uh, ICD-10, the systemic inflammatory response syndrome, in ICD-9 it could either be caused by an infection or something that's not an infection. In ICD-10, it's only non-infectious etiologies. So SIRS applies to severe pancreatitis, major burns, major trauma, tumor lysis syndrome. If we think somebody is having an inflammatory response to an infection, we have to go old school and just use the word sepsis. Not SIRS due to infection, they can't code from that, but sepsis. In diabetes, we all know that diabetes causes uh, extraordinary complications. When we link them to the diabetes, we get increased relative weight for it. Procedure codes in ICD-9, four digits in ICD-10, many more digits. The inpatient procedure codes in ICD-10 are used by the facility only, by the hospital only, for patients in inpatient status. So in the office, if we do procedures, it's CPT only. 
outpatient surgery, same day surgery, in the emergency department, or even in the hospital in observation status, it's CPT only. With this caveat, if the patient is admitted to inpatient status within three days of the procedure, the hospital has to code and, and bill the procedure in uh, ICD-10 PCS codes. But the physician still uses CPT codes. Now, uh, debridements, this is important to hear. In the year 2006, Medicare spent a little over $20 million paying for excisional debridement. They got 17 million of that back because they were miscoded because we didn't document the term excisional debridement. We used the term sharp debridement, which apparently every residency program teaches their physicians to use, but the coding system does not equate sharp debridement with excisional debridement, so we have to use the word excisional debridement. So different terms, tissue removal using wet to dry dressings is coded as extraction, foreign body removal is coded as extirpation, which is a term that I'd never heard before. Sounds like my, something my mother would want to wash my mouth out with soap for using. And excision is using tissue removal with scalpel or scissors. And we need to note the depth to which we go. And excisional debridement is much higher weighted than non-excisional debridement. But if we don't use the word excision, they will code it as non-excisional. And this is not new information. I mean, this goes back as far as 1988. So uh, we just have to use the term excisional debridement when we're doing anything to cut tissue back away from the wound margin. Here's an example of, even with no secondary diagnoses, when we use the term excisional debridement, when that's actually what we're doing, it's 40% higher weighted than non-excisional debridement. For breast surgery, this highlights the difference between excision and resection in terms of coding. And mass is a term that, that does not code to anything. We have to use the term tumor or neoplasm to get that level of credit. And of course, remember, you know, laterality or they might deny the claim. With lymph node dissections, different codes for left and right for all the uh, lesions. And in the coding system, biopsies code as excision if you're just taking out one node or a piece of node or a piece of anything. If our intent is to take out the entire chain of lymph nodes, then taking out the entire organ is called resection. Now I know when we do a colon resection, we may not be necessarily taking out the entire colon and the coders you know, understand that. Uh, but for the coding system, they code things to resection when, when the intent is to take out the whole uh, lymph node chain. I've always wondered how you know you've got all the nodes, but if the intent was to take them all out, then they code that to resection. So the, the, the bottom line is if your intent is to take out the entire chain of lymph nodes, that needs to be communicated to the coders rather than just taking one. So if, if it's a biopsy or an excision, just one or a few diagnostic, the last digit of the procedure code is diagnostic. If you take them all out, then it codes as a resection, which is a different last digit number. As I mentioned, if we're working on the lesser curvature of the stomach, it has different codes than on the greater curvature. And for complex procedures, you know, we're pretty good about documenting those sorts of details, but different codes for lesser and greater omentum. And if we're doing cardiac redos and releasing different parts of the anatomy from adhesions. There are different codes for the atrium left and right and ventricle left and right. And here's the importance of that. If we don't add that specificity, the relative weight is 3.7 and change. When we code all four, it's 4.6 and change. So there's a significant increase in the relative weight. And it's those added numbers that accrue to our total quality of care and cost efficiency of care analyses. Used to not make any difference, now it does. Frequently missed secondary diagnoses at the highest level of credit with surgery, uh, acute respiratory failure. Sometimes this can be a little tricky because once the patient gets to the recovery room, the uh, intensivist may want to, you know, some grounds to justify their critical care billing. But to, to diagnose acute respiratory failure, it has to be something that's not routinely expected, something that would be unusual for the circumstances of, of that procedure. Uh, perioperative strokes, metabolic or toxic encephalopathy. Have to be careful about that one too because many times in the postoperative period we give patients medicines to make them goofy and so we can't really, you know, that's our intent, so we can't really diagnose encephalopathy uh, based on that. And acute renal failure due to specified renal pathology. Most acute kidney injury that occurs in the hospital is secondary to acute tubular necrosis or ATN whether it's a uh, result of hypertension or hypotension, 
or, uh, or uh, contrast-induced nephropathy. If their if they're creatinine bumps after a contrast procedure, uh, if it doesn't normalize with hydration within three days, then we can note the mechanism as ATN and that acute kidney injury goes from a secondary diagnosis at the mid-level of a CC to the MCC when we specify the pathology as ATN. Here's some other commonly undocumented perioperative <coughs> oxygen dependence. Well, I'm oxygen dependent. We don't get any extra credit for oxygen dependence. Uh, but if they have chronic hypoxemia or hypercapnic respiratory failure, we get increased relative weight for that. Systolic or diastolic dysfunction, if we call it systolic or diastolic heart failure, we get credit. Bedridden state, there's a diagnosis called functional quadriplegia. It's not a neurologic quadriplegia, not from a cord injury, from a fracture, a cord transection, or cord infarction. It's due to frailty or a severe physical disorder like in-stage Alzheimer's, where the patient is, is not able to feed themselves, not able to turn themselves in the bed. It's not a neurologic quadriplegia, but it's functionally a quadriplegia, and that has a massively high relative weight, secondary diagnosis at the highest level of an MCC. The relative weight in the HCC system, the one that you know, goes toward our grading, it's five times higher than an acute ST elevation MI, the relative weight for functional quadriplegia. So if they're bedridden and functionally quadriplegic, then we use that term and we get huge relative weight. If someone is simply HIV positive but has never had an age-defining illness, never had an age-defining CD4 count, you can't even report that in California. But if they've had AIDS or previous history of AIDS, then we can't at extraordinarily high uh, relative weight. Diabetic gastroparesis uh, does not get us the relative weight that diabetic autonomic neuropathy does. Just one of those idiosyncratic, arbitrary, things in the coding system is what we get credit for, what we don't. Drug or alcohol abuse, if we note the dependency of whatever alcohol, methamphetamine, um, opioids, then increased relative weight for that. If they have symptoms of withdrawal or being treated with the medication to manage their symptoms of withdrawal, even higher relative weight for that. Any late effect of stroke, a lot of times we're accustomed to seeing the dysphagia, the dysarthria, the unilateral weakness, if we can state that and add the, the, the linking phrase due to stroke, then we get increased relative weight for that. There's an increased emphasis on intraoperative versus postoperative events. There are different codes for intraoperative hemorrhage or hematoma versus postoperative hemorrhage or hematoma. Increased emphasis on complications. And the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality has these things they call patient safety indicators which are things they think ought not happen post-operatively, pressure ulcers, dropping a lung when we put in the central line. So it's, it may be important to note if someone has a procedure following which a pneumothorax uh, is not unexpected, then uh, uh, it's important to, to note terms like you know, expected or integral to the procedure, that sort of thing. So the coders will know not to code that separately. Catheter-related infections from urinary catheters or you know, IV catheters, they think we ought not let people fall out of bed and break a hip after they're in the hospital, DVTs, pulmonary embolism, things like that. It's not a horribly unreasonable list. The definition of complications, it's something that's more than routinely expected, has to be a cause and effect relationship, and documentation in the record that it's a complication. Now that doesn't mean we can never call something a complication and we'll have a zero complication rate. Uh, because the coders are required to, to query if they have a question about that. This is an example of a query that one of the organizing bodies had produced. And I put this green box around these terms. If we can note this terminology in the operative report, the coder can code it appropriately without having to issue a query that interrupts your workflow. If we note that it's a complication or we say it's integral to the procedure or not clinically significant, uh, then the coders will know not to code whatever we're talking about as a complication. Acute blood loss anemia is an absolute loss of RBC mass, and their H&H &H may be normal if they've not had time to be you know, resuscitated with crystalloid or to uh, equilibrate. So if their H&H &H drops on the next hospital day, we may want to note that the acute blood loss anemia was present on arrival, so um, it doesn't get misinterpreted. The criteria, 20% drop in hematocrit, following the hemoglobin, 
two grams per liter from baseline, or if we do transfuse two or more units of pack cells, but the transfusion is not required. Obstetricians, uh, you know, a C-section, they expect to lose a liter of blood. And so obstetricians will let young healthy women go home with hematocrit of 20 or 21 without transfusion, uh, and, but they can still document acute blood loss anemia and get that secondary diagnosis at the level of a CC. And these are not automatically coded as complications of the procedure. So surgeons can comfortably use the diagnosis of acute blood loss anemia and it's not gonna be an automatic ding against them. Unless, of course, it's a complication. I mean, if, uh, if you're doing an appendectomy or, you know, that's probably, you don't expect a, a lot of blood loss, but if something gets nicked, uh, then it uh, might be uh, uh, an actual unexpected event. So this is a definition of acute kidney injury. Creatinine increased greater than 0.3 milligrams per deciliter or one and a half times above the baseline. And as I'd mentioned, most hospital acquired acute kidney injury is acute tubular necrosis rather than medullary necrosis or cortical necrosis. For the chronic kidney diseases, we get no increased relative weight for stages one, two, or three, but for stage four or five, we do. Most reports now will give an estimated glomerular filtration rate, so uh, that may help us classify that. The MCC is reserved for end-stage renal disease where somebody's getting dialysis or transplant. A big opportunity to diagnose uh, at a level of uh, secondary diagnosis of a CC is malnutrition. They've changed the requirements. We don't use albumin and prealbumin anymore, which was easy because you just order a lab test. Now the new aspirin criteria uh, has six criteria uh, and you need two or more to diagnose malnutrition, insufficient energy intake, weight loss, loss of muscle mass, loss of sub-Q fat, or localized or generalized fluid accumulation that may actually mask weight loss and diminished functional status as measured by a hand grip strength. And they have these hand grip dynamometers which actually give you a number. And uh, this is something that the dietitians can, can do to identify levels of malnutrition. If there's, if there's any level, mild or moderate malnutrition, it's a secondary diagnosis at the level of a CC. If they have severe malnutrition, that's a secondary diagnosis at the highest level of an MCC. And there's, a, in, in, there's an appendix in the back of the handout that goes through uh, why the albumin and prealbumin aren't utilized anymore. That, I, I produced that basically for my own education, but I thought I might as well share that. Hospital acquired conditions are under scrutiny. Uh, this is the list of uh, things that Medicare has produced as uh, hospital acquired conditions. If these things occur during the course of a hospitalization after the inpatient order is written, uh, they may have on the table uh, identification of a secondary diagnosis at a level of a CC or an MCC, but if they happen after the inpatient order is written, we do not get that added relative weight ascribed to our total quality of care score. The hospital does not get any additional funding that would accrue to, to adjustment of the DRG based on that. We just all have to eat that. Pressure ulcers that go to stage three or four. If somebody has a pressure ulcer on admission of a stage one, which is just red skin that does not blanch with pressure, then if that deteriorates during the course of hospita hospitalization, we do not get deemed for that. So it's very important to document uh, stage one pressure ulcers uh, as uh, present on admission. So any kind of uh, catheter associated infection, whether urinary tract infection or IV, uh, and they expect if patients come in uh, that aren't in DKA, we ought to keep them out of DKA. I got no problem with that. Wound infections and dehiscence. So the clinical documentation integrity team help us when our handwriting's illegible or we're not clear with what we're saying or, or consistency. They like to see things, you know, conditions to code them reliably and make the review audit contractors keep them at bay because they make their living taking diagnoses away and taking money away from the hospital. Uh, and so we, we like to see things mentioned more than once just to, to make sure they understand we mean what we're talking about. But what CDI is not, is not about upcoding. That's attributing a condition to a patient that they do not have. Uh, that's fraudulent and we don't, we don't do that. But what CDI is, is understanding the rules and regulations and guidelines prepared for us largely by non-physicians. And these are mandated by law that we follow these, not the ACA, not the Affordable Care Act, but the, but the HIPAA legislation from back in the 90s. Now, uh, if you do get queries, sometimes they can seem like they're 
uh, imprecise or, or indirect or confusing. Uh, they, you may get the impression that the coder really doesn't know what they're asking. Uh, that's not the case at all. If we, for example, say down arrow sodium 120, but we don't use the word hyponatremia, they cannot code hyponatremia. They can't give us credit for hyponatremia. So when they ask us to use the word, they can't use the word to ask us. They can't ask us, does this mean hyponatremia? They have to say, what's the clinical significance of this? So if it sounds, if you get a query and it sounds indirect, it's because they, they're not allowed to introduce a term that you've not already introduced in the record. It's just, it's one of those arbitrary, crazy things. So this is a general equivalence map. Every ICD-9 code here, what it's called, every ICD-10 code and what it's called, and whether it's an exact match, an approximate match, or whether there's so many options, you really need to look at the at the, uh, the tables. Now we're going to have for you a digital version of this table uh, that you, that's searchable up in the in the top right corner you can uh, and you type in like uh, Crohn's and it will go to this area of the table and this table is like 2500 pages long so don't print it off uh, but it will give you an idea particularly if if you, you have coders in your own office that code things they can look at your top 10, 20, 30 diagnoses in ICD-9 and see what to expect for ICD-10 to make it uh, easier for them. We also have this table for you as well. Every ICD-10 code, its description, and whether or not it has an HCC code, those are the ones that are most important for us for establishing our quality of care cost efficiency scores. You know, there are 70,000 ICD-10 codes coming. There are only about 70, 70, HCC codes, everything does not have one. Uh, things that are short term, not resource intensive, may not even have a code. And it gives the relative weight for patients in the community versus patients that are institutionalized like nursing home patients. Uh, if there's one of those uh, surgically associated PSIs, it will be noted here. If there's one of the Medicare identified hospital acquired conditions, it would be noted in this column. And this says in, for the Medicare uh, DRGs, whether it's a secondary diagnosis, at the accreditation level of a CC and MCC, not depicted here, or, or neither, and then in the Medicaid system, uh, Medi-Cal system, uh, what their severity of illness and risk of mortality scores are. So we talked about the mnemonic to kind of help us think of ways to, to link condition and cause, cause and consequence, so we don't have to memorize 70,000 codes. We can use this to help get us the, uh, the specificity that the coders need to give us credit for it. Dr. Kennedy, my partner, has this rule of three to establish the validity, clinical validity of something, to mention a condition at least three times so the review audit contractors know we meant this. Three parts of speech, the condition itself is the noun, and then some descriptive term at the time of admission, particularly for a chronic disease. You know, they had it last week. What's going on with it this week? Is it just their chronic condition, uh, not exacerbated, or do they have an acute exacerbation? Linking caused by, due to, resulting in, and during the course of hospitalization, are they better, worse, the same, or has it resolved? And the verb, the third part of speech, what are you going to do about it, what are you doing about it, what have you done about it? And then very importantly, once on the problem list, always on the problem list, we want to preserve the condition for the discharge summary so we can uh, make it easy to get credit for it. And uh, a lot of conditions resolve with interventions, so we don't want to forget them. Sepsis gets better, acute respiratory failure gets better. So lawyers will tell us if we didn't document it, we didn't do it. And the payers tell us that if it's not documented, we didn't diagnose it. What we say is if it's not documented, we can't get credit for it. So we want our patient's true severity of illness to be represented in our documentation in language that allows the coders to give us credit for our patient's severity of illness so we don't get downcoded, we don't get denied. The services that we provide, their medical necessity for them is well understood by the payers our quality portrayals will be accurate and our cost efficiency portrayals will be accurate. Thank you, I greatly appreciate your time and we're gonna, we're gonna get through this. We're gonna not just survive but thrive.